Hey, uh, you know, we have some real fun, exciting wines here today. We have uh, two super Tuscan style wines. We're going to be tasting our 2012 Tahoma, the Reininger Tahoma. It's a kind of a, a one-off wine. I don't know if we'll ever be doing it again, but really fun, special wine. Uh, sister to the Chima, the our crowd favorite here. Um, and we're also going to be doing our Chima Picola, the Helix Chima Picola. That's a 2017. And we're also doing the 2017 Runninger Malbec. And all of you guys are so damn lucky. Two of these wines, I don't even have a bottle of for my own cellar. So um, things, uh, you guys have been hitting us up pretty hard for these wines. And uh, it's fun to see. And uh, there's been so much demand for it. Uh, we accidentally sold everything we have so much so that I had to bring my own wine back from my cellars so we could fulfill all of our orders. So, um, but happy to do that. So tonight's a real treat for me too, because I'm not going to be tasting these wines again for a long time unless somebody's really nice to me. And uh, uh, that's me sharing a bottle of uh, the Malbec or the uh, uh, Tahoma. So, but um, you know, right now I'm going to introduce Abby. She's our marketing and events coordinator here at the winery and uh, acts as our moderator for these events and uh, keeps me in line, as you guys all know, which I'm sure that you guys are very appreciative. So I'm gonna turn it over to her real quick to see if she has anything that she wants to say before we get going here. And so, Abby. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. No, I think you said it all. Um, we're super excited. Um, like Chuck, the last time I tried the 2012 Reiniger Tahoma was back in January when it was still in the barrels. So I'm super excited for this to probably also be my first and last time trying it. Um, so just looking forward to the evening. So let's, um, let's get started. I'm going to get going on the, the, our 2012 um, uh, Reininger Tahoma. This is the bottle right here. I don't know if you guys can see it or not. Uh, it is the sister wine to the Reininger Chima. And I think I have a bottle of that right over here. Let me grab it real quick. Well, I found a magnum of it anyway. So here's the magnum. So you can see the Chima is the black label and the Tahoma is the white label. So if you guys have these wines in your cellar, Voila, really nice pair. And uh, so it's actually inspired. The Tahoma is uh, similar to the Chima in that it uh, is, a, they're both super Tuscan blends. And, but the, uh, the blend is a little bit different than the Chima and the Tahoma, uh, but it's aged longer too. So the Tahoma was actually aged uh, uh, just a, uh, gosh, what was it? Close to eight years anyway. It's uh, six years in the barrel. So Chima is six years in barrel and the Tahoma is eight years. And you see some real fun differences on there too. I'm just going to tell you uh, real quick uh, what the blends are. And I'm going to have to read it off the back of the label here. It's 47% uh, San Joe Base, 24% Merlot. 21% Cabernet Sauvignon, 5% Malbec, and 5% Petit Verdot. The vineyards that it comes from um, are Walla Walla Vineyards. So there's Pepper Bridge, Seven Hills, and Excel Vineyards. Um, the oaking on this is 88% uh, French, 12% uh, American, and um, not a lot of new oak on this. Um, San Giovese is kind of an oak sponge, but uh, we only have about eight or 10% uh, new oak on it. So real, real judicious anyway with the, with the oak. And um, so now I have to remember which glass it was actually. Yep, it is. It is this guy right here. 
that is the Tahoma. So, yeah, nothing like uh, playing games on the winemaker. Huh? I have a couple of glasses set up down here for each of the wine, and I move them around on me. So, um, but anyway, uh, the Tahoma has just been a super fun project. We're really, really psyched about it. One thing um, that really gets me in the nose, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, like blackberry reduction um, in there. So, um, man, that and a little bit of cassis and uh, macerated black cherries, a um, little leather happening. And uh, sometimes um, I'll even get a tiny bit of um, umami and a little little bit of hint, a real faint hint of, um, of wood spice on there too. So, but mainly what stands out to me is um, in the nose, I can tell there's a real nice um, uh, liveliness uh, to, to the fruit in there too. So uh, just by the nose itself, I'm expecting this wine to actually show some pretty good acidity to it. Man, oh man, it has beautiful acidity to it. Um, 2012, I, I failed you guys. I really don't remember what um, the specifics of the vintage. What I do remember with 2012 is it followed 2010 and 2011, two very cold years. Uh, here's the coldest we've had really since uh, we uh, started the winery in 97. But 2012 bounced back and it was almost perfect average year as far as heat units go. So uh, that I do recall, but as far as what the spring was like, the uh, specifics of the summer, Man, I'm getting old and I don't recall that far back. So, and uh, I didn't have time to do as much research uh, uh, for this as I wanted to. But I can tell that um, uh, because it was average year here as far as heat units here in the valley, um, that uh, we got some really nice acidity. I, I suspect that uh, we it was probably a very nice uh, protracted fall, cooler fall. Uh, to give us this wonderful acid. So um, in the palate, I'm just getting this really laser focused uh, fruit going on in there. And, and the acid really helps on that too. Another thing that really sticks out to me, really super soft, um, soft tannins going on. So that's one of the advantages of uh, having all that aging and that cellaring. Um, the, and with not a lot of uh, new oak on there, there's not a lot of um, uh, wood tannins to be uh, added to this. So very soft, wonderful, like say laser focused fruit. Um, you know, the fruit has to me, reminds me the palate anyway, uh, reminds me a lot of uh, what we talked about on the nose. And um, also this, the, the texture on it, um, it's kind of has like a glassy juiciness to it. The, that acid really, acid helps, um, well, it just makes things juicy, if you will. And uh, so because it has plenty of acid, um, it just has this really wonderful, fun, uh, glassy, juicy texture. I've never used that as a description of wine before for texture, but to me, that's what it seems like. Um, so, And the finish is just, I really get some really nice big cherry, long finish. It's just really persistent. So anyway, you know, like I say, just really judicious use of oak. You guys are so lucky. Hopefully all you guys, how many of you out there are, are actually have the Tahoma in your glass? Do you guys have it and are drinking it? See a few of you. <laughs> You, you guys are shaking your hands, showing the wine. Yeah, a couple people shaking their heads. No. Oh, gosh. Well, if you don't have it yet, um, man, oh, man, uh, you'll, you'll be getting it on your doorstep here pretty soon. So uh, you guys are in for a big treat. Big treat for me. You know, the what's nice about this for me, even though it may be a long time before I taste this wine again, 
um, you know, it's already been cellared and aged uh, for a long time already too. So, um, but you guys are probably wondering how long can you cellar this? I honestly, um, I think you could easily still hang on to this for another 10 years, no, no problem. But if you want more fruit in it, I'd say in the next three or four years. Um, but uh, you know, this wine, gosh, it's already eight years old. But uh, and it's just it's just stellar. So I am so freaking glad that we made this wine. And uh, uh, man, I we're gonna have to try it again someday. But it might take a while before we can. So uh, uh, anyway, there you guys go. Cherish it. I know I'm cherishing this evening. Gosh, that, that's gonna stick with me for a long time. Like it's right here. My my taste memory. So, so Chuck, how did you come up with the Tahoma blend? Well, um, we um, wanted to do something similar to the Chima, but even just extended a little bit longer. Um, and we put a little bit more, a little bit of mall back in there and stuff, played around with it. So it was more just, again, just kind of playing around, seeing the, uh, you know, what else we could do. We, there, we had um, some of the, um, no, what do I wanna say here? I had some wines anyway that, uh, some barrels that I wanted to age a little bit longer and have some more fun with it, you know, kind of pushing the envelope with the Chima and um, uh, seeing how long things go. Because, you know, all the time during the winemaking, we've always tried to learn and kind of push the envelope a little bit, um, whether it be with um, SO2 levels that we use. Um, so over the years, we played around with how much SO2 to have in the wine. It gets, if you want to talk SO2, that can get a little technical. Um, but uh, as a winemaker, I've had to learn do we low SO2 levels or higher SO2 levels how far can we push the limit? And um, because with lower SO2 levels, we tend to, the wine changes more and evolves more in the barrel, but you have to be careful. The SO2 is what protects it from the wine from oxidation in, in the barrel. So we have to be careful not to let those wines oxidize. So how low can we go? The other thing that we played around with a lot was, um, how far between topping the barrels? How long can we wait between topping the barrels? Is it every week, every two weeks? So we played around with that. Um, and uh, so, the, or a month, every two months or so. So we played around, we're just trying to find, find the boundaries uh, for our wines and the style of wine that we make. And really that's one of the fun things, I mean, that's one of the things uh, we are trying to do here pushing that envelope, seeing, you know, how far can we uh, barrel age these wines? And we kind of get a little experience with that in the CPR uh, red blend, but that's a little different. But all of this is, you know, just, it's, um, uh, yeah, just like I say, trying to push the boundaries and learning where, where our guardrails are, if you will, uh, with winemaking. And plus coming back from, uh, Tuscany a couple of years, well, a year and a half ago anyway, Tracy and I went to Tuscany with uh, friends. And uh, so I saw wines and tasted wines there that had uh, some very long uh, extended barrel maturation. So all of these things kind of influence why, why we did this. So it's a little different. It's different blend uh, than, the, uh, than the Chima. Um, uh, so, uh, but still basically around that 50% uh, Sangiovese uh, level uh, versus 50% Bordeaux. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's why, that's why we did it. I think, what did I say The It is, yeah, 47% Sangiovese in, in, in the Tahoma here. So, so that's, the, that's the reason. Chuck, I'm guessing since you've also tried this wine very few times, uh, you haven't done a side-by-side -side with either the current 2014 Chima or the 2012 Chima, have you? 
Uh, actually, I have. We did do it. Um, I have tasted it with the 2012. And um, what I find with this, I think, as I mentioned earlier in the tasting, the fruit, it just seems so laser focused on this. Um, and which is great. Um, when you get this wine on your palate, I mean, it just, hmm, it's, the flavors are there and uh, it's, um, in a sense, light of foot, very lively and, uh, and the textures in it are, are just, just gorgeous. And um, so in the 2012, we get a little bit more um, um, leather going on, um, I think, uh, than this. So, um, so yeah, fun, fun wines. And, um, I, I love them both. So like I say, you guys, you, you have it made. There you, there you go. Tahoma. Yahoo. See that in the image there? That's the image of Mount Rainier. I should tell you the meaning of Tahoma too. Tahoma is the indigenous people's name for Mount Rainier. So in fact, on this little, if I can get my camera, there we go, exposure to get. If you will look over on the right side of the mountain there, you see a little peak over here. So this is an image of Mount Rainier, an abstract image of Mount Rainier. The little peak on the side is known as Little Tahoma. So. I see the fence here, they're, man, if you want to see, they have the most incredible view of Mount Rainier from their living room. It just looks right through the woods, right at Mount Rainier. So, uh, man, oh man. Uh, hope you don't mind I used your name. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, yeah, Mount Rainier is just a very, very special place. All right. So anything else there, Abby? A couple more questions. Uh, people are really excited about this whole extended barrel maturation project we've been slowly unrolling all year. Are there other wines to maybe expect in 2021 that might be in this same project? You just talking about ones that we've had. I, I wouldn't call it the same project, but you're talking about wines with a little more barrel of um, maturation, extended barrel maturation. Yes. Um, well, yeah, we just starting with whites, a CPR reserve Chardonnay. Um, that's, um, that's has a little bit anyway. Um, the, we have the 2000, that's a, um, 2018, but the 2016, uh, Helix under has a wood label similar to the cola here. Um, that's a 2015. So uh, yeah, that has some, for white wine anyway, some real beautiful um, uh, extended oak on it. And what's really nice about that wine too, it's just super, super uh, judicious. Um, boy, we have the, well, there's the Chima also, uh, the, the Tahoma, and I'm trying to think, I know we have more. Abby, you might, I might need your help here. Well, this year we also did the CPR Carmen Air, the 2014. Yep, that's a, that's a new one for us. And uh, you'll see another uh, one as far as that coming down the road too. So we'll be doing, that is very successful. So we're going to have another one of those extended barrel maturation come out. And then we also did the Syrah XM and the Merlot XM. Thank you. Gosh, my memory, man, is so bad. Yes, XM, it actually stands for extended barrel maturation. So um, yeah, those are, those are fun. And uh, yeah, hop on those guys for sure. The Syrah XM is just absolutely beautiful, man. It's, it's a little bigger, chewier um, Syrah, but uh, gosh, I, that one is, just drop dead gorgeous. And the Merlot is too. And uh, the uh, Merlot XM. So yeah, jump on that too. That, uh, that has a, um, 
the Merlot, I, it has a little more oak anyway than the, uh, as far as actually oak imparted flavor into it, where the Syrah just has more, it's more texture oriented. So just makes it bigger and chewier. So, so yeah. So yeah, the XM projects. <laughs> Are there any um, that are still in barrel that you're maybe keeping your eye on for? Yeah, we have a couple other things going on um, back in the um, cellar anyway. So, um, but those are yet to, we're going to keep those things a little closer to our vest right now. So, uh, but we'll, we'll find those, talk, talk about them someday. <laughs> Perfect. And then we had one more question and that was, have we ever kept wines a little bit too long in the barrel room where they've ended up passing their peak and we've ended up having to, unfortunately not? Um, nothing that we, yeah, over the years we had um, a, just a couple of barrels that we had more wine than we wanted to bottle, um, but it's nothing that's going to see the light of day with anything, so. Um, yeah, we've had we've had that experience. We've had oh, I don't know, two or three barrels that that we've done that with. Couldn't figure out exactly what we wanted to do with them, and uh, we just had more than we wanted to barrel, and never never quite determined what we wanted to do. But what it did help us do too is again, it's kind of pushing that that edge, those those uh, boundaries anyway. And uh, we learned what we don't want to do. And that's really important to figure, figure that out. So. so yeah. Okay, well, onward to the Helix Chima Picola. There we go, this is a 2017. So we have two 2017s this evening. And so when we talk about 2017, the, um, the vintage itself um, was, it started out real cool. And um, so um, I recall, I think we might've even had um, snow on the ground a little too, not as long as, not as late as 18. I think 18 was the real long year. Anyway, it was, it was a cool, cool spring anyway. Um, and another very warm, hot summer and um, uh, the fall turned out to be really nice, gave us some real nice, nice hang time for the fruit. Um, I'm gonna have to take a look here. Um, as far as the, um, the blends anyway on this wine, or we have, um, it's 49% Sangiovese, 12% Merlot, 16 Cab, and 3% uh, Petit Verdot. So, and oh man, I'm gonna refresh my glass here a little bit. Oh yeah, gosh. Yeah, I love that. You know, the nose on this is really fun. I get a little bit of, um, rose petal kind of a hint of wisp of um, uh, potpourri going on in there. Um, man, some really nice black cherry and currant and plum. And man, got some nice little bit of little bit of fig happening on that that too. So Oh man, what I really like about the mouth on this. Um, the mouth itself is, it's kind of uh, luscious. There's a, there's a chewy factor to it. And um, to me, it's, this, this is a fun, fun kind of super Tuscan blend. The, the tannins are, are fine, but with age, with a little bit more time, the tannins are even gonna get softer in this puppy. Um, I get a lot of black raspberry and plum um, a finish. Mm. 
Um, get some really nice kind of dry cherry going on in there. I think of dry cherries because I've been having them in my uh, seal cut oatmeal lately. <laughs> and uh, kind of recognize them in there. So, but there's also kind of a really nice, um, I think a little nice uh, mineral aspect happening in this wine too. And um, you, the vineyards, this guy comes from Stillwater Creek uh, is where the San Giovese comes from, but Finney Hill and uh, Stone Tree Vineyard. So Stone Tree is located right in the center of the state by Mattawa and uh, uh, Finney Hill is down um, center of the state, if you will, but right above the Columbia River. So it's on top of the um, Horse Heaven Hills Plateau. If you rise up from the Columbia River, where it's the border of Oregon and Washington, and uh, you go right on up, and once you get up on top of the Horse Heaven Hills Plateau, anyway, there's a small hill all to itself on top of Horse Heaven Hills called Finney Hill. And uh, so that is where some of the Cabernet Sauvignon comes from. And uh, the Petit Verdot comes from uh, a Stone Tree Vineyard, which I think is the best Petit Verdot in the state. So, and by the way, we had a wonderful vintage out of uh, Stone Tree this year. Last year, we were unable to harvest there. The whole vineyard was not harvested uh, to, due to an unfortunate uh, uh, grass fire that uh, they had in uh, 2019. So man's hats off to Stone Tree sticking with it and uh, coming back strong this year. So anyway, man. But uh, yeah, this is, this is a really, really fun, fun wine. Now between the two of them, again, they're both super Tuscan wines. Um, this to me has a little more refining to do through age. Um, so it's tasting really nice right now. But again, those tannins are gonna round out, smooth out a tiny bit more. It has a tiny bit of grip to it right now. Um, but the uh, Tahoma there, there's just such a difference. And um, uh, I use that word laser focus uh, that the fruit is in, in the Tahoma versus this. It's, the fruit is well integrated in this, but I think uh, with time anyway, you're really gonna see um, a really nice, um, just uh, boy, smoothing out of the, of the whole uh, 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 mouthfeel anyway on this, so. Yeah, you know, it's a cherry and black raspberry. Love it. Man, oh man. Anyway, yeah, and the, the acidity on there, you know, it's just a real nice moderate acidity. It doesn't have quite as much acid as the, um, as the Tahoma does, but uh, gorgeous wine. I am really, really pleased with this. Every time I taste this wine, um, it just gets better and better, you know, so things are more integrated in it. Um, it's not as angular as it used to be. So, ma'am, this thing I think is, is really nice right now, but uh, this is one definitely in two or three years. It's, it's really gonna smooth out more. So, do you guys have any comments anyway on your uh, observations between the two wines? How many of you have this wine? Any of you? All right, a few more people have it there. All right, good, all right, good deal. So, well, if any of you have both, uh, does any, uh, if you have some comments that you want to share with, with us um, and your observations, let her rip. So. Um, the fans are trying both of them. They broke out their Coravin for tonight, and they can definitely taste the difference in tannins between the two. Um, but we do have a couple questions I have for you. Sure. Um, and... The first one is, how long do you recommend aging the Chima Percola? Well, like this guy, like say in two or three years, it's gonna be much nicer uh, as far as the tannin, and it's gonna be softer, um, but I think they're fine now. The Chima Percola, um, boy, I, 
You could easily put it down eight years. I don't think you'd have any any problem putting it down with eight for eight more years if you wanted to. Um, uh, we also got a request. So Chuck, this will be a to do for us in the winter is to bring in more vineyard managers like we had Ed Kelly, um, particularly after hearing you talk about Stone Tree. Uh, we're getting lots of inquiries about that one. Yeah, well, we might be able to do that. I can, I could talk to Ted. I think that's a great idea. I'd be glad to talk to Ted and uh, ask him if he'd be want to do something like that. So, yeah, most definitely. Anything else? I'm just, I'm uh, having a love affair now with this this Malbec and man, oh man, I just. So I'm going to freshen this guy up a little bit too. Just looking, looking at the color here with, with my Malbec, it, it is, you know, Malbec always has that real beautiful um, uh, purple or magenta color. When you look at Malbec, you know, if you look around the rim anyway, um, it has a distinctive magenta color. Not a lot of wines do that. So that is one of the things I really look at um, when a wine is being poured. Oftentimes I can look at it and just I say that that's a Malbec just simply because of that magenta ring around it. It's a very, very distinctive. So gives you a good, good hint of it. But the color Malbec just has really gorgeous, gorgeous color. Um, it, it's a fun wine. Um, I think we've talked about it in the past quite a bit. You know, in the vineyard itself, when I'm tasting the Malbec, the Malbec fruit off of the vine, a lot of times it actually tastes almost closer to a white grape than it does a red grape. And it's kind of like Christmas because um, you don't really know what uh, it's going to do until you unwrap it in the fermenter and you really get it fermenting. And then it just starts extracting these wonderful flavors from the skins that are undetectable, really, um, in the vineyard. And uh, to me, there's, there's definitely a secret, like, particularly like Carmenere, as to when, when to pick Malbec. And I'm learning more and more about it all, all the time. And, um, so uh, every, every vintage, I, I seem to get more and more confident uh, with uh, my decisions in picking this grape. So it's a fun grape too, because um, this year, although it's, I haven't tasted this wine for a while. Um, and a lot of the 2017s, if you've joined us in before, um, some of these virtual tastings, I've mentioned how 2017 particular Bordeaux varietals, of which Malbec is one, seem to be really closed. Um, in other words, they're hanging on to uh, uh, their fruit. When you pour the wine in the glass, it kind of hangs on to its fruit. It just doesn't want to express it, let, let the fruit notes out. And uh, uh, so um, it's what we call being really tight. So they've been tight and wound up and uh, all of the Bordeaux 17s have. And uh, so it's really nice to see this is starting to loosen up and chill a little bit. <laughs> so um, to me, it's always had, is in the past, it's had a real rustic character to it, which Malbec does, but this vintage seemed to have even more rusticity than Malbec normally does. But it's nice to see now that it's really starting to to open up a bit, but um, in the past, I've been getting a lot more kind of a mushroom and uh, um, earthiness out of this Malbec, more so than any other vintage, but now that fruit is beginning to open up. Um, sometimes I'll get a little bit of uh, steak tartare. You know that I, if you joined us before, you know that I just, I love that, that in a wine. Um, there's, tiny bit there that seems to be diminishing too compared to uh, when I've had it uh, in the past there but it has a tiny bit look just a real fine layer of white pepper going on and I uh, get a lot of black raspberry and uh, black and red currant going on 
And, um, you know, I used to get uh, hints of uh, rhubarb in there too. But again, it's starting to open up. I get just the, now I just get a little wisp of, of some rhubarb in the background, but um, more like um, really, gosh, really intense uh, baked rhubarb. Um, but it's just really fine and uh, get a bit of plum in there also. So gosh, man, fun nose. It, to me, man, this is just like, you know, going outside and running all over the mountains again and uh, discovering something new in an area that, you know, I spent a lot of time in, but yet, oh, wow, you know, find a little area or something that um, I hadn't explored before. So it's fun seeing the clouds lifting off the mountains, if you will, and starting to show itself. So, man, oh, man. All right, well, time to taste this bad boy. Oh, wow. And tannins in this soup have even mellowed out quite a bit on this. Um, you know, Malbec isn't uh, particularly known for huge tannins, but um, from the last time I remember it, um, you know, it just had some real medium tannins. I'm, I'm pushing that to soft. Uh, man, the, the meat, the tannins in this are, are really softening up on it. So, and um, the acidity is nice on this too. It has really super nice acidity. Again, like that um, uh, uh, Tahoma, uh, that acidity just kind of helps lift the fruit and um, uh, makes it a little lighter on its feet, makes the wine a little more lively. Man, I love this wine before, but wow. I have to admit, I never thought I'd love it this much, man. <laughs> this is really, really opening up and um, really becoming what, uh, what we really had uh, hopes for during the 2017 harvest. It's just amazing, it just blows my mind because uh, you, know, you see things in the vineyard, you, you know, you're working with the fruit, and uh, then we put these wonderful wines together and sometimes you put them in the bottle and you know, it just becomes like that petulant uh, little kid. Uh, nope, not gonna do it, no way. And uh, that's what, you know, a lot of these 17 Bordeaux have been like. And uh, so it's nice to see them uh, maturing and uh, becoming nice teenagers. <laughs> Chuck, do you compare our Malbec in style to those from um, Argentina and Chile? I think the Malbec here expresses a lot more fruit. It has a lot more openness to it. Where um, the South American Malbecs, you'll have a lot more. Um, remember, I talked about the, the rustic uh, qualities to it. Um, in um, Mendoza, if you get where the higher elevation vineyards um, outside of Mendoza, that's where you, where you get the more fruit expressive um, uh, wines anyway. So if you learn a little bit about um, the location or elevation anyway of, uh, of the Argentinian Malbecs, look for the higher elevations because it's also, you're gonna get better acidity in there and just better uh, fruit expression. So the diurnal temperatures, uh, that's a difference between daytime and nighttime temperatures. There's a greater difference between them, those. And so uh, when you have higher diurnal temperatures, usually you'll see a little more intensity in fruit. And uh, so that's what I would really look for. But generally speaking, uh, Washington State Malbec is even compared to Cahors, uh, which is Southwest France, uh, where you'll find uh, most of the Malbec in France. In France, um, these I think Washington State Malbec is much more um, expressive. So, um, and you know, Malbec here I think can grow well 
in a lot of different places here in, in Eastern Washington. And, uh, but I really am very, very fond of Pepper Bridge Vineyard uh, there in Malbec. And we've actually um, have started working with another Malbec uh, vineyard, uh, Stone Valley. So last year, I was able to source um, one ton of fruit uh, last year to give it a try. And uh, so that was the 2019 vintage. Uh, we were very, very pleased with it. And uh, that's down over towards Seven Hills, but um, in the rocks anyway, just below Seven, seven Hills. And um, uh, we're really pleased with it. So um, I actually contracted a, an acre of it this year for 2020. So um, we're, we're pleased with it. So it'll be fun to uh, see, see what happens and uh, where we go with the Malbec from from here going forward. So, them. I am happy we opened these, Abby. <laughs> we were debating whether to open the uh, the Malbec and uh, in the Tahoma here this evening because we don't have any. We don't even have any in the library here at the winery. Um, so, um, I. Man, we were debating whether to open them, but we did. And I'm not sure where the heck you found these either. <laughs> but maybe you don't want to tell me that. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how long did we let them breathe versus how long would you recommend all three wines should breathe? Are you saying breathe? Yes. When, when we open up? Yeah, um, I would definitely let all of these wines breathe longer than uh, I did today because um, I opened them up right before we started this tasting. But uh, in this Malbec in particular, as we're, um, as it's going on, I just keep, the fruit seems to be expressing itself more and more. Uh, right here in the tasting room, I also have to admit, um, it, it's kind of chilly in here, you know, so it's not uh, necessarily room temperature what I would have at my house anyway. Um, so it's a little on the chilly side in here. So it's going to take longer for these things, for these wines to volatize and release that fruit. So, um, but um, the Tahoma, I would, um, one, I would let the wine rest for a couple of months after receiving it, if you can, um, if, if you have the patience to do that. Um, but um, if you can let that breathe, you know, two or three hours ahead of time, uh, I think you'll you'll be you'll be great with it. Um, the uh, Helix uh, Chima Cola. That is still, I think, showing a little young. You could even splash it around a little. I don't think I'd go splashing that to home on the end of the decanter. Um, if you decant it, I think you can gently decant it. Uh, but the Chima Picola, you can put that in the decanter and actually, actually cover the top of the decanter and uh, give it a little shake. I wouldn't be so aggressive as if it were, um, you know, a recently bottled wine. Uh, but yeah, get some air to that. And you, you know, this wine, you could actually, the team of cola, you know, open it tonight and uh, tomorrow night it will probably be better. So um, that's how, uh, you know, younger wines is, is really fun. I mean, sometimes even uh, two or three nights later, even, um, especially like the, the 2017 Malbec, um, I would have said that um, earlier, you know, a couple months ago, I would have said, yeah, open it up and let it sit for, you know, have a sip or half a glass of wine and let it sit for uh, a day or two. But this is really starting to show itself. And so when we talk about aging wines too and how long to let them sell or, um, again, you have to calibrate your palate for how much you like aged wines. So I love young wines and I love aged wines. I, I love it all. Um, so, but uh, some people uh, just prefer more uh, fruit forward wine. So if you want to have more fruit in your wine, uh, 
again, the question of how long to let these things age, um, you know, don't, don't push them to the limits. So it all depends on what, if you want more leather um, aspects uh, and get to that point and more tobacco in your wines, particularly in the uh, Sangiovese spectrum, Anyway, yeah, let, let them age a little bit longer. So versus, so you get that, the leather aging aspect versus the fruit. So kind of have to decide. Again, what's fun is buy a case and you get both. So you taste some when it's young and you taste some when it's older and voila, satisfies both. And you get to learn and see that entire aging spectrum. And the more you do that, um, the more you're going to learn and you'll be able to determine, you know, where on that spectrum, the aging spectrum, um, where your preference is. And uh, so, you know, six case you know, or six bottles of wine to, you know, half case allows you to do that. So um, that's all part of the part of the learning process. So. So check my favorite question food pairings with all of these. We already had someone mention that they have it, they're having it tonight with a, oh, I had never even heard of that type of cut before, a rare grilled pecanha, which, is that just a steak cap, I'm guessing? What is it called, a pecanha? Mm -hmm. No, I'm not familiar with that. Huh? Maybe they can give you some it, clarification. It's a Brazilian sirloin cap cut. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I tell you, um, my favorite with Malbec usually, because um, of that little bit of rusticity, but also um, the, the wonderful blackberry, uh, wild mountain berry, sometimes that's characteristic with Malbec. Anyway, and this one too is, is buffalo, man. I just absolutely, or should I say bison? You know, I just absolutely love Malbec with bison. It is just, it is just fabulous. I find with bison, it has a little bit more acidity in the meat, um, especially if it's uh, been aged well. Um, but any kind of, uh, I think, uh, grilled, grilled, you know, baseball cut, uh, filet mignon or something that's been uh, grilled in, um, yeah that uh, that's good. But also I mentioned that baseball cut, man, I think the, um, the Tahoma would go really beautiful too with uh, something, something like that. But um, I would, with the, um, uh, with the Tahoma anyway, um, I, this is one that I think could lean, well, more toward, you know, Americana, um, you know, like say the, the steaks, but it's also going to go well with, um, a, you know, your more heavier based uh, tomato based um, uh, Italian foods, the Chima Piccola, um, same thing, maybe not, not quite, quite as heavy with it, um, but uh, yeah, I, man. Yeah, they're 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 all they're all they're all fun. That that's for sure. Um, my favorite topic. <laughs> so, yeah, they're um, trying to think what else with the Chima Cola. Gosh. You know, Chima Picola actually even, I was just even thinking of a little steak tartare with that too. That, that'd be gorgeous with that too, so. But yeah, anything, anything else? If you don't mind us jumping back uh, to the, the Sangio based wines. Uh-huh. Um, people were wondering if you could talk a little bit about the difference between the Sangiovese Grosso we've released in July, mm -hmm. compare that to the Tahoma, the Chima, and then what Sangio was used in the Chima Picola. Yeah, the Sangiovese, because we have the Bordeaux uh, grapes in the Tahoma and the, the Chima. Um, you're, you're going to get a little darker fruit 
characteristic anyway um, in the in the Tahoma, then you're going to uh, with our with the Sangiovese Grosso. Sangiovese Grosso though is for a Sangiovese that particular clone uh, can provide some really nice darker fruit when it comes to a darker fruit spectrum for for Sangiovese. Um, but uh, it, uh, I would say this is, the Tahoma is a, definitely a, a bigger wine, if you will. So uh, like I say, you could um, serve it with, uh, you know, steakhouse type food versus like the Sangiovese Grosso. I, I would try to keep it more with, you know, um, it's more native Italian uh, heritage anyway, so. In the Sangiovese Grosso, I think you'll have a little bit more um, herb, herbal notes with it too. Uh, wonderful. Um, you know, going through the chat, I, I think, I hope I'm not missing anybody's questions. Oh, here's one. What conditions would lead us to produce another fabulous Tahoma? Another fabulous Tahoma. Um, well, it has to do with what we what we have in the cellar, and uh, just watching those wines um, age, if you will. So find finding the right wines for it, and um, so, and we possibly we possibly could. Um, so, but time will tell. So. Um, we are actually producing a little bit more, we're trying to produce a little more, bit more Sangiovese to try to um, meet the demand of, of the Chima and um, some of our other Sangiovese. So um, if we see those wines, how they're progressing with time, uh, we just might decide to pull the trigger to go ahead and, and do another one, so. So it's something that would always be fun to do, but um, it's it's nothing that we can decide to do at harvest time or plan plan ahead for it, if you will. It's all predicated on how well it's aging in the cellar. I'm so glad that we did this, and I am thoroughly enjoying this, and uh, I hope you guys are too. All all three of these wines, I. You know, my, I had great expectations for them, but uh, I, these wines have exceeded the ex, my expectations for what we were going to be experiencing tonight even. So, um, so yeah, I'm just happy as a clown, <laughs> to tell you the truth. And can't wait to take some of this home and, uh, and share it with my family when I get home. So, and Abby, you get some of this too. <laughs> Yay! Um, okay, we got one more question, and that was in a previous Zoom. You mentioned um, Tempranillo as a new sourcing for us, as well as that stone, uh, the new Malbec. Somebody's been joining us on some of our previous virtual tastings. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, how is that evolving? Really fun. Um, you know, right now, uh, we're going through malolactic fermentation in the cellar. And uh, to tell you the truth, nothing's a lot of fun to taste when it's going through malolactic fermentation. So um, anyway, it's uh, fast and furious and malolactic. Uh, we were just talking about this last week because we uh, were tasting through just about everything. Well, I shouldn't say just about everything. Everything that we made and um, that we made this year. And this is the first year of Tempranillo. And so um, the, it's funny, I like it a lot more than Raul liked it as far as I was able to get, um, I seem to be tasting much more fruit in it than uh, Raul was anyway. But nothing like say, when things are going through malolactic fermentation, they're not a lot of fun, they're fine when they're fermenting, but. Malolactic fermentation is a secondary fermentation which metabolizes malic acid into lactic acid, um, which is a, a not as harsh acid as malic acid. And 
So um, just when it's going through that stage, not, nothing tastes good. I mean, just talk to just about any winemaker and nobody really likes uh, tasting wines during malolactic fermentation, other than the fact that we taste them just uh, to give us experience and know what to expect and uh, what to be looking for during that process. So, but when it comes out, I think they're gonna be really nice. Um, the, the tannin in there is really fun. I think I mentioned it on another virtual tasting that as we're fermenting, the wine seemed really soft, um, but the nature of the beast is, is this huge, you know, big tannic wine. And uh, for the first couple of days, tannins were real manageable and we're trying to manage the tannins. Uh, but all of a sudden about day four, maybe it was day five, all of a sudden, man, we, we tasted it the night before and they were just, hey, this, this is great. You know, we're doing a good job managing the tannins. And then the next morning, oh my gosh, the tannins dropped, dropped out of the skins and yeah, who there, there they were. So, um, so far it's, it's a fun adventurous thing to learn how to uh, work with it and um, manage its fermentations. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to it. And I think I mentioned earlier in that too, that that wine me be a candidate to be able to blend in uh, CPR too. So uh, CPR red table wine. So fun things with it. It, it is gonna be, I think, uh, an exciting fun wine. And, uh, we get that from Stone Tree Vineyard. That's where we got the Petit Verdot that's uh, blended in the, in the Tahoma. And I think that is like say the best Petit Verdot vineyard in my mind anyway, in the state. I've never tasted Petit Verdot better from any other vineyard. So, and the Tempranillo, I think it's, it's a good site for it. Like it's lots of heat. All right, guys. Well, with that, gosh, so fun to see your faces. And uh, we're just rocking and rolling onto Christmas here. And, uh, getting through these other other issues in life and so it's fun seeing you all and, and thank you for sharing this evening with us and uh, gosh we love sharing the wines with you this is just fantastic I, I hope you've enjoyed them as much as I have because I'm going to go home and enjoy them even more so uh, looking forward to it